Welcome everyone. In this video, we're going to take a look at some shell code that uses a simple, relatively simple obfuscation technique and that it XORs a large part of its functionality in order to bypass uh, detection and other analysis mechanisms. It has uh, at the beginning of the shell code, just a little bit of code, kind of like an unpacking stub that, that goes through uh, once it finds its location in memory, uh, XORs the rest of the shell code, and then jumps to execution. Now, of course, we have a couple of ways that we could analyze this. We could do this dynamically, wait till the shellcode has um, gone through this process of, of XOR decoding itself and then just extract it from memory. But I wanted to show you a way in which you could use Ghidra in order to do that. As you can see here, we're open to our project page with Ghidra. Uh, we have our shellcode file. I'm going to just call this shellcode.bin. And if you uh, would like to follow along, there'll be a link in the description. You can download the same shellcode.bin file. So. This is just a, a file that contains all of the, the raw machine code, the shell code itself. From here, uh, we'll go ahead, we'll create our new project. Uh, we'll make this non-shared since this is just a demo. Uh, and I'm just gonna call this shell code or XOR shell code. From there, we can drag and drop our sample into our folder. And this will begin the process of importing. Now, um, this uh, anytime you add shell code because it's void of any sort of file format, uh, PE file, Mako, ELF, um, it's just raw binary. We have to tell uh, Ghidra, the disassembler, what type of language to inspect or expect in here. And this I know uh, because of the, the source uh, that I got the show code from. Uh, actually, this is something that I made uh, in part from some malware that I analyzed a little while ago. Um, I know that it's 32-bit and it was intended for Windows. So if we do a filter, we can find x86. That gives us our 32-bit. And I usually just select Visual Studio. Now that we've selected the language, we can click OK. This will give you some uh, this the summary dialog uh, uh, after the the import. Uh, again, though, this has not been analyzed yet, so we haven't actually started the process of of trying to disassemble or decompile the shell code. To do that, uh, we can just double click our shell code, or we can drag and drop onto the tool that we want to open it with. In this case, I don't have a lot of tools, uh, just the default code browser. So I'm going to go ahead and double click. Now, once this begins, um, it will recognize, Kija will recognize that analysis has not taken place. And we certainly want analysis to take place, although it, it actually doesn't matter too much in this case, because since it's lacking an entry point, it doesn't have a file format, um, not, of a, not a lot of analysis really will occur here. So there's not functions that, that are going to be detected and signatures that are going to be applied and all those things that we we typically get as a benefit from running through the auto analysis. But uh, we can go ahead and, and ask it to do the analysis for us. Uh, again, I'm just going to uh, accept the default options, uh, tell it to analyze. Let's make this a little bit larger. Okay, um, you'll see once the, the binary has been analyzed, uh, again, because it's not able to recognize the entry point since it's not defined per a file format, um, the analysis is, is, is somewhat incomplete. Now with this shell code, and any time you extract shell code, you, you generally understand, or you need to understand where the shell code will begin execution. Uh, with this particular shell code, it begins at the very first offset, so the beginning of the shell code itself. So what we can do is we can go to the beginning of the shell code. You can right click and you can either choose uh, disassemble, or you can just hit the D key as you saw here with the, uh, the, the menu, the D key is the shortcut. So I'll hit the D key. Um, you'll see that it'll begin the process of disassembly. And it's here that we wanna analyze our code to try to understand not only if it is using a technique, an obfuscation technique, the XOR encoding, um, but then you know where does that technique really pick up? Uh, of course, this shell code has to be, you know, in a sense, self-sufficient. It has to be able to at least start with valid code in order to do the run through the XOR loop and you know decode the remaining shell code. So we can suspect that the beginning of this will, will likely be correct. Um, the very first thing is an unconditional jump to an offset of uh, this label, lab 16, 16 bytes in. And you'll see from there, uh, there's a call to a function that is defined back towards the very top of the show code. What you'll see once we enter that call is that there is immediately a pop into EAX, um, then there's a move into ECX, and then we enter uh, this looping structure right here. This is our XOR loop, our XOR instruction, and we can also see you know, an important aspect of it, which is the key that it is using for um, XOR encoding. So when it comes to XOR, if you XOR a value with a key, um, you get a result. And if you XOR it again with the same key, you get the original value. So if you see this hex 97 as part of our XOR operation, and then as you, you look through the rest of this code, you see 
uh, the hex value 97 throughout, that's a good indication that XOR was used because um, a null byte or a zero XORed with 97 is 97. XORed with 97 again is takes us back to zero. Now, with a lot of Windows shell code, uh, it tends to have a lot of null bytes. A lot of Windows code ha tends to have a lot of null bytes. And so if the authors didn't take the extra care of, of trying to reduce or, or minimize those, um, then it becomes a bit more prevalent of a, of a pattern. There are some other things that were, were quite important here. Now, if we go back to the call instruction, um, remember uh, or, or recall that the call instruction not only transfers execution via the CPU, um, the instruction pointer to the, 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 you know, the call target, the, the operand here, um, but then it also pushes the address for the return. So in this case, uh, we call to this function and we push the, the address for this next instruction onto the stack. Once we enter this, um, this location for this function, you'll notice there's a pop EAX. And so what that's doing is it's a part of the, the pick position independence code and that it is now able to, regardless of where it's at in memory and, and what is the actual virtual address for the base of this allocation that the shellcode got placed in, it's able to figure that out because now it's popped, or I'm sorry, it's, it's pushed that address, this address right here on top of the stack, um, and then it popped it into EAX. And this is of course important because not only then does the shellcode, is it able to locate itself in memory, uh, but you'll see that EAX is, is used later in this loop here um, as we XOR the value that EAX plus ECX times 1 um, points to. And, and these brackets around those, that series of, of registers is dereferencing. So that's the base of our allocation down here. Uh, ECX then is our counter. So we're starting um, 186 bytes. Uh, well, that's 186 in hex, so you'd have to do the conversion um, from base 16 to base 10. Um, it's it's converting, uh, it's, it's adding that to the base of the allocation, the base address. Um, and then it's, for whatever reason, the disassembler here does is using a, a times one, um, likely because uh, this is just, you know, incrementing through memory one byte at a time. Um, so that's uh, how it's actually taking and, and walking through the memory in order to do the XOR. So calculates the address, um, dereferences the data at that location, XORs it with 97, stores it in this location, tests the ECX, ECX is our counter, um, and if we have not reached zero, then we, we loop back and continue this process. Once ECX is zero, then there is a call to EAX. Now again, remember EAX is the base of this, well, it's this address right here. So it's going to go to essentially the base of where the shell code has now been um, XOR decoded. Uh, now, had you not recognized this, have you, had you just started looking at this, this shell code, you might, you, you know, you might look at these instructions here and it may not immediately jump out, although the more you, you look at these, uh, the more nonsensical patterns start to emerge. And, and some of the, you know, not only the instructions that are being used, not that exchange is a strange instruction, um, but just a lot of the, you know, the instructions that are actually actually being called with some of their, their operands or their arguments, they just don't really follow the, the conventions of normal code. They start to look very odd. Um, you do tend to see oftentimes with this as well that we get, um, you know, in complete disassembly uh, and or either large chunks of code that just cannot be disassembled, which is certainly the case here. So this would be another, you know, larger indication that something is, is just a bit off here. Uh, and, and, you know, this isn't something that you would necessarily recognize unless you are, you know, familiar or developed a, sort of a comfort with looking and analyzing um, lower level code. So the question is, what can we do to get this uh, code out? Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, uh, there's two options, I think. Um, you could run this in a debugger. You could set a breakpoint on this call or set a breakpoint to this location here. Um, although, uh, depending on your breakpoint, you need to be a little careful there. A software breakpoint might get overwritten. Um, so I'd probably set it right here. Uh, once this breakpoint is hit, you know that this should all be decoded and you can extract it. Um, that takes a little bit more work though, because we have shell code. We can't just fire this up in a debugger. We have to actually take the code, uh, convert it into its, or, or keep it in this binary state, oftentimes convert it into some sort of a char array, add it to a program, launch, you know, compile that program, launch it. I mean, there's any number of ways in which we could get this, the shell code 
into some form of you know some sort of a program that would allocate it into memory and, and break before the execution um, and, and maybe we'll cover that here in a future video uh, but for now like I said I wanted to go the other route which is to do this all statically so um, in order to XOR decode these and to do it in a way that um, you know the, the, the amount of content here that we're going to decode uh, in order to, to kind of understand how far we're going uh, let's grab a calculator Okay, so we can actually calculate um, how far we need to, or how far this loop is going to reach. Um, it, it probably looks somewhat obvious that it's just going to, to go to the end of the shell code, but uh, this just helps us to be maybe a little bit more precise, or at least understand a little bit better, you know, what this code is doing. Uh, if you took a, take a look at this address here, um, we have the, the the virtual address, or typically it was a virtual address. And in terms of when dealing with shell code, since we don't have uh, the disassembler, the, the, the tool Geezer doesn't have the ability to you know map it or pretend to map it into virtual address spaces, uh, you just get raw offsets. So the beginning of our shell code is an offset of zero. Um, this is uh, 1B, so it's, it's 1B bytes into the shell code. Um, this is the op code. Right, so not to be confused with the offset. Uh, and if we add that value, the offset 1B plus our loop, so we're going 186, then that should tell us how far 1A1 uh, that this is, uh, you know, the address that it's essentially starting at, which is the end of our shell code here. Um, so we can see that it's going to start at this address. It's going to start XORing um, until it gets all the way. To the instruction right after the call. Now, in order to convert, we want to just simply XOR all of these bytes. Uh, if we only had to do a few of them, it would be fairly easy, um, and maybe we could just do that. You know, you could po potentially do it manually. Um, in a previous video, we looked at um, opening up the hex editor and just manually modifying these bytes. But there's enough of them here that it'd be great if we could just simply select all of this code and XOR. It. And fortunately, you can. So. One of the things uh, that you can look towards for this type of uh, you know additional functionality would be to look at the Ghidra scripts. If you click on the little um, play button here, that will bring up the script manager. And uh, inside of the script manager, if you're if you're running with a default installation of Ghidra, then you have all of the default scripts. This is one of them. If you search on XOR, you'll see that there is an XOR memory script. XOR is the memory of the current program, and this is exactly the, uh, the behavior or the capability that we need. Now, in order to do the XORing, we need to select the region of memory. And if it's not quite clear, you can actually take a look at the script manager. And if you open up, let's see, the basic editor, and you can you know, do this in a number of ways. Um, you may see some additional help, although with this one, all you're getting is the license information. Um, so you may be forced just to then analyze uh, what's really going on with the logic within the script itself. Um, so let's highlight all of these instructions. So I'll get my cursor there at the first byte. We'll scroll all the way down, hold shift, grab the last byte. Before we can do the XOR though, uh, we have to right click and clear code bytes. So we could have done this easily with the C key as well. And what this does is it essentially clears the disassembly. If we don't do that, uh, you know, Gitra puts uh, basically a lock on that disassembled code and we're not able to change it. So uh, we select it all, we clear the code bytes. Now we are able to go to our script manager. If you um, select the play button for our script, then that will bring up, in this case, it'll run the script. And in order for this script to work, it's going to present us with a dialog. That dialog is asking what value we want to use as our key. And it needs to be a, an appropriate hex value. Fortunately, we already know that. That's hex value of 97. Now we hit OK, and you see the bytes have changed. So now all of the bytes here have been XORed with our key. And we can go back here, hit this, uh, the D key, and now we have um, accurate disassembly. So we saved, I think, quite a bit of time versus having to try to extract this out of memory. Although I'm not saying that would be any, that's all that, you know, necessarily all that difficult, um, but this was certainly a lot quicker. And you'll also notice that, of course, this is a much different looking code. And so now we're, we're able to see exactly what the shell code was up to. 
Um, I wasn't going to get into all the details of the shell code itself. This is something that I, I do plan on covering in some future videos. Uh, what the shell code is, is doing, and this is some basically a toy program, uh, is that it's, it's um, parsing the PEB, the process environment block, in order to get the base of NTDLL. And then from there, it is walking the NTDLL to get... Um, or walking uh, the PE file, yeah, NTDLL, to get uh, certain exports functions that it wants to call before eventually making a, a simple function call down below. So I use this as, as sort of some you know basic learning shell code. Uh, but we'll talk about those. I plan on walking through that logic here and analyzing that in an upcoming video. So hope you enjoyed learning how to do some uh, straightforward XOR decoding with Ghidra and the built-in scripts. And uh, we'll look forward to talking to you in a future video.